Lesbian Psychologies, Explorations and Challenges, edited by the Boston Lesbian Psychologies Collective. Introduction. This book is a feminist revision of the lesbian experience. It grew out of a number of concerns and frustrations. The paucity of written material on clinical work with lesbians, the limited opportunities for lesbians in psychology to discuss their work and their concerns, and the growing awareness of certain themes and patterns in lesbian relationships that were difficult to compare and confirm when working in isolation. A group of us began to, dis to discuss the possibility of working toward a feminist understanding of lesbians as individuals and in relationships and as community members. Work by researchers and theorists in the psychology of women, particularly Nancy Chotterow and Carol Gilligan and Jane Flax, offered insights into female development and relationship styles that we thought could be applied explicitly to lesbian experience. We hoped that a volume such as this would add to the understanding of our multitude of our multiple identities, challenge our thinking, and inspire further theorizing and research, and we organized a conference to bring together theorists and practitioners who had worked in this area. We believed that in coming together, the participants would have an opportunity to recognize the bravery of lesbian authenticity and to celebrate the richness, joy, and vitality of lesbian lives. Our hopes were realized first in the conference and then with the essay essays we present in this book. We have worked on our collective editing in a challenging historical context. We have faced a problem lesbians often face. Whatever we do must necessarily be new. Past psychological literature on lesbians, particularly psychoanalytic theory, with Freud as an example, has been non-feminist at best and usually makes us look pathological. Feminist work on the psychology of women ignores lesbian issues. It focuses on concerns of women with regard to men and the patriarchy, sex roles, achievement, careers, dual role families, gender differences and abilities, and non-existent therapy practices. Virtually all of these issues affect lesbians too, but they are experienced in a different context because lesbians use women, not men, as a reference point. There are additional and sometimes more pressing issues as well. The lesbian is often invisible in the psychology of women or even in feminist psychology papers of course, and courses. Her particular perspective on these women's issues has been ignored. Apart from some articles in family therapy journals, discussion about lesbian psychological issues has primarily taken place outside of the field of psychology in journals such as Conditions and Heresies, and in fiction and coming out stories. To speak and write about the feeling and experiences of lesbians in the language of psychology, we have had to consider our words carefully. The language we inherit from our professional journals is, is oppressive, or the language of feminist analysis must be developed to express those psychological concepts that we choose to explore. In addition, we want to choose our words and essays to avoid the possibility of exploration of this book, sorry, exploitation of this book for titillating purposes, as we feel has happened with lesbian nuns. We have put this book together in a climate of homophobic fear and anger that has been exaggerated by the AIDS epidemic. In Massachusetts, for example, two foster children were removed from the home of a well-respected gay male couple. The Massachusetts Department of Social Services had known that the couple were active in the gay community when it made the placement, but it then responded to a public outcry by transferring the children to a quote-unquote traditional home. In the wake of this incident, Massachusetts has moved to limit foster parenting tradi to traditional families, with mother at home and father at work, a policy that cuts out a very large percentage of those previously employed as foster parents, not only gay individuals and couples, but also heterosexual working mothers. These events have weighed heavily on us as we made decisions about essays submitted to us. As a result, we have been particularly concerned in this volume about the focus on lesbian quote-unquote problems. Most chapters are written by clinicians who see lesbians in times of distress and who, as clinicians, have chosen to try to understand the nature of that distress. None of our authors considered the choice to be a lesbian, sorry, None of our authors considers the choice to be a lesbian in any way pathological. They recognize that most lesbians' problems arise from societal hatred and oppression. However, as editors, we were aware of the possible negative effect that a book dealing with these problems may have in the time of increased anti-gay hysteria. Despite the possibility that our book could be mis misrepresented by the media and the courts, we decided that it offered substantial benefits to lesbians and to clinicians working with them, and that it was worth publishing. We have chosen to structure this book into sections that focus on that focus primarily on issues of identity, relationships, community, and struggle. 
We considered dividing the book into theoretical and clinical sections, but realized that most of the chapters included both perspectives. As the index makes clear, many topics, such as responses to homophobia, coming out, intimacy, and sexuality, cut across all sections of the book. The book addresses the following questions. Who is the healthy lesbian? What do we know about her identity, her couple relationships, her relationships with family and community, and her psychological strengths and struggles? What does the lesbian who chooses to work with a, psycho with a psychotherapist or counselor bring to discussion? What do mental health workers need to know about lesbians? And what stereotypes about lesbians must be discarded as mental health workers and others consider the diversity, diversities of lesbian experience? Lesbian Identity Of all the topics covered in this book, the issue of lesbian identity has been most written about by scholars of the patriarchy and thus has been most misrepresented. Toward the end of the last century, medical and psychological theorists categorized lesbians, sorry, characterized lesbian development as related to biological abnormalities, either genetic or hormonal, or to psychological quote-unquote deficits, such as arrested psychosexual development or constitutional inferiority. Sadly, lesbian authors such as Radcliffe Hall in The Well of Loneliness espoused such notions and used them as a plea for tolerance. Today, following the well-developed arguments of lesbian and gay professionals, more enlightened members of the psychological and psychiatric professions have redefined homosexuality so that it is no longer regarded, per se, as an indicator of mental illness. This viewpoint, which embodies, which is embodied in the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Disorders, the DSM-3, contradicted the entire previous education of psychiatrists, both formal and societal, and no doubt had little effect on practices. Even the more enlightened psychological professionals have not moved in a positive direction. Their discussions about the individual lesbian ask whether she is quote-unquote egosyntonic or quote-unquote egodystonic, that is, does she quote-unquote accept her lesbianism or not? Discussion is scant, however, on the complexity of her acceptance, or not as it relates to the systematic homophobia and her actual life situation. Moreover, even the diagnostic categories have changed. Theorizing about lesbian development is still solidly in the realm of looking for quote-unquote causes of this quote-unquote psychopathology. It does not look for the for the casual events that permit, sorry, it does not look for the causal events that permit or encourage or constrain a woman to live in a lesbian or heterosexual life in adulthood. These theorists look for early quote-unquote trauma or developmental difficulties for their explanations, and these explanations focus only on the lesbian choice. The recent literature that demonstrates that lesbians are less pathological than non-lesbian women receives scant attention. Mark Freeman in Homosexuality and Psychological Functioning and Andrea V. Oberstone and Harriet Sukonek in their 1976 article demonstrate convincingly that lesbians are healthier than heterosexual women on a variety of standard psychological variables such as self-esteem and not significantly different on other important ones. But these voices are still the minority in standard psychology literature. In contrast to the bulk of traditional homophobic literature, the voices of lesbians speaking in the 1970s and 1980s express the multiplicity of ways in which the choice of lesbian identity leads to a happy and healthy life. The work towards authenticity by, lesbian, by the lesbian can result in a thoughtful, well-examined life. In fact, she is virtually obliged to engage in these processes in this process because the patriarchy has carefully rendered invisible role models for being in the world as a lesbian. We hardly see such models in literature or films or during our childhood. There is no single lesbian identity, nor is there a single lesbian identity development. Indeed, we have chosen to use the plural form, lesbian psychologies, in the title of this book to emphasize the diversity of ways of being a healthy lesbian. Some of us chose to be lesbians because we found that in our relationships with women and spiritual qualities and psychological or emotional connections gave us great satisfaction and empowered us in our own potentials. Some of us chose to be lesbians for more strictly political reasons, in order to counter heterosexual privilege and to develop non-aggressive and non-hierarchical structures for interpersonal relationships, that is, to live in egalitarian relationships with our lovers, friends, and communities. Others of us feel that our connections and attractions have always been exclusively to women and that a lesbian identity has led us to discover who we are despite the lack of models available to us. Others feel we were born lesbians. Some of us recognize our ability to relate intimately, sexually, and emotionally to both men and women. Two chapters in this book specifically address the diversity of our sexual identities. Rebecca Schuster, 
considers bisexuality within the lesbianism matrix, and Carla Golden discusses the varieties and ways in which middle-class college students identify their sexuality, which may or may not line up with their overt sexual behavior. Buffy Dunker reminds us that of other diversities and of different ages at which we come out and of different ways of being a lesbian at different ages. The chapter by Norma Gracia, sorry, Cheryl Kennedy, Sarah Perlman, and Julia Perez articulates the tensions that might result from differences in our racial and ethnic identities. Being out in the face of the severe homophobia in our society is difficult. Our invisibility and our minimal pool of positive role models means that we must find our way to positive self-image often alone and against the negative stereotype. Unlike many minority people who have no choice in whether they will be identified as belonging to the minority, many of us have a choice as to whether we pass or to identify ourselves subtly or more overtly as lesbians. Lee Zevi and Sally Cavallero, in their contribution to this book, make vivid the, vir- the various pulls shaping our development. Sorry, shaping our developing sense of lesbian identity. Different attitudes toward the healthiness or quote-unquote goodness of being out of the closet are also reflected in the book. Sherry Zitter's chapter on coming out to one's mother assumes that this is something that we we will all want to do. Yet Dunker remains sorry. Yet Dunker maintains that it is not necessarily healthy for every lesbian to be out in every situation. As a consequence to these many stresses involved in choosing the way she presents herself and experiences her authenticity, the healthy lesbian may often decide to enter counseling or therapy to focus on the specific issues that arise for her. Before we consider those concerns, however, we need to discuss how a lesbian enters into relationships with a partner, her family, and her community. Couple relationships. For many lesbians, entering a relationship is the event that signals the choice of a lesbian life. The lesbian couple relationship is probably the most intense of all romantic relationships and the most egalitarian. Conflict within the relationship is a concern of our contri- is a concern of our contributors. The lover's vitality and electricity is described in a number of chapters in this volume especially those by Margaret Nichols and Beverly Birch, who suggest that the joy and happiness in bodily contact with another woman springs from a buried primal experience. Birch expands our theories in explaining the positive aspects of lesbian relationships. To date, most of those trying to understand the lesbian couple have considered only problems such as dependency, power imbalance, and sexual incompatibility. Our expression of conflict in the couple relationship is problems of sexual compatibility. Experiencing differing desires for sexual activity brings many couples to therapy. For example, Pepper Schwartz and Philip Bloomstein report in American Couples that lesbian couples tend to show diminishing sexual activity and interest after the second year. Nichols and others in this volume offer a number of answers to the question of why this happens, as well as suggestions that can be facilitate, sorry, that can facilitate the continuation of a rewarding sexual relationship. Deeper issues that trigger surface arguments or their equivalent include the pulls both towards and against dependency discussed by Sue Vargo and Beverly Birch in terms of quote-unquote fusion or quote-unquote enmeshment and consequent distancing within the couple. Conflicts in a couple relationship may be resolved both inside and outside of traditional counseling or therapy. Vargo discusses conflict resolution in terms of enhanced communication and a clarified sense of self as a distinct from us in the relationship. For couples terminating relationships, Bonnie Egelhart and Catherine Triton-Filu discuss ways in which negotiation allows the partners to understand personal and psychological dimensions of the conflict and attain a sense of closure. It is, we discover, impossible to consider lesbian couple relationships apart from the question of identity and ways of relating to the community, family, and society. Because outside groups rarely offer recognition and respect for a lesbian couple, Couple boundaries are often indistinct, and, as Sally Crawford points out, individual lesbians and couples must spend time deciding how to establish themselves as a family. Working on these issues as a couple can serve to bind the couple. No one, to our knowledge, has determined the extent to which which response to these pressures serves as an emotional glue to hold a couple together, and to the extent to which these stresses can push the couple to terminate their relationship. 
relationship of the lesbian to her family. Lesbians often choose friendship groups that function in many, in many of the same ways as families do for heterosexuals. However, many of us continue to relate, for better or for worse, to families of origin, and a number of us have children from prior heterosexual relationships. Many of us have children by choice as declared lesbians. Alongside our lovers and, fan and friends, we consider all these people our extended family. Most older lesbians grew up in heterosexual families, yet discussion of the experience of the lesbian child in the nuclear family has been silenced. In the lesbian, sorry, if the lesbian chooses to be out, her family's initial reaction may be to ignore her statement or to banish her from the family. Lesbians who choose not to be out or not to act on lesbian life choice have long served family roles as quote-unquote spinsters, providing support for the rest of the family, as reflected somewhat pathetically in Radcliffe's Hall's The Unlit Lamp. Few families know how to truly be supportive. However, there are some who try, and who join organizations of parents or families and friends of gays and work together on our behalf. For some of us, the choice to live as a, les a lesbian lifestyle is an explicit choice not to live the lives of our parents, and more particularly the lives of our mothers. Coming out within the family, as Zitter points out in her chapter, raises issues for ourselves and for our parents and has an impact on family dynamics. Families that pride themselves on openness must deal with this previously unmentionable topic. Will the parents appreciate that their daughter will have a greater potential for having her needs met, as Zitter phrases it, or will they assume that the daughter can never be happy unless she leads a life just like theirs? Our relationships with our siblings are also virtually unexplored. Although it is our sense that lesbians will often first come out to their siblings, whether or not they have siblings who are themselves gay, and might actually have closer relationships over time with siblings than heterosexual children do. If our first role to negotiate within a family is a child and sibling, our adult role in our society is assumed to involve parenting children. However, many people assume that lesbians do not have children. Lesbians often have children and make extraordinary efforts to keep custody of their children from previous marriages, for example, facing unpleasant court cases or deciding not to be out until the children are out of the home. A number of young lesbians today are choosing to have children on their own or with partners. Even if they know that some lesbians do have children, the homophobic element in our society often asserts that lesbians should not have them or be allowed near them. Part of this prejudice derives from the belief that children are not, or at least should not be, tainted by sex, combined with the false assumption that sex is what lesbians are all about. A significant aspect of the prejudice has to do with the fear that children of the lesbians will not grow up to play the appropriate heterosexual sex role. This would threaten the patriarchal roots of our society that, vast, that vest power in men and establish women and children as their property. Another component of this prejudice assumes that the child of the lesbian will suffer a social stigma as any choice, as any child must, who is different in our conformity demanding culture. Marjorie Hill points out that it is not necessarily a disadvantage to grow up quote unquote different in our society, however. Lesbian mothers, for example, provide many positive qualities for their children, such as a lowering of sexual expectations and a valuing independence and self sufficiency. Hill's study demonstrates that if we do our research ourselves instead of having it done to us, we can frame the questions and, ap and appreciate and interpret the answers in ways that counter homophobia and document our special qualities. Because lesbian parents, sorry, parenting has remained so invisible, the lesbian parent has the challenge of creating new family structures and family processes from scratch, as Solly Crawford points out. The lesbian family must counter the fact that it is the best that is that it is at best invisible is often assumed to be impossible and at worst meets true hostility. We are in the process of creating ways for lovers to relate to each other as parents and to relate to each other's children. We are starting to create rituals to celebrate our coming together and our decisions to add new family members. We are working to balance carefully our roles regarding our children and their roles and ours regarding a society that has a hard time seeing our choices as healthy. Much thought thereof goes into the development of lesbian families with children, leading to identification and resolution of questions taken for granted by many heterosexuals. Families, then, may hold a greater diversity of strong meanings for lesbians than they do for others. 
Our struggles to create alternative ways of interacting with our various family members may be painful and stressful at times, as any therapist will recognize. But there are many joys in making conscious decisions about our lives and in creating a new kind of relationships, sorry, and in creating new kinds of relationships with others outside the limited roles of quote unquote traditional nuclear family. Through these struggles, we make new structures and model and models familiar for ourselves, for our community, and in the long run for society in which we find ourselves. Struggles slash clinical issues. In the course of realizing her identity, engaging in relationships, and participating in community, the healthy lesbian will encounter many psychological struggles. A few essays in this volume look at specific concerns that confront women in special ways and lesbians in additional ways. Lee Nikoloff and Eloise Stiglitz suggest that alcoholism has been a greater problem in the lesbian community than for the heterosexual women because for so long, lesbian bars served as a major place to meet other lesbians in Western culture. Moreover, alcohol and drugs may be used as a recreation to external and internal homophobia. Sorry, a reaction to external and internal homophobia. Issues of sexuality for lesbians and heterosexually active women would appear to be different on the basis of the Bloomstein and Schwartz data. Two chapters in this volume point out that it is not age per se that diminishes sexual desire in lesbian couples, Dunker, but rather relationship dynamics and female socialization, Nichols. Laura Brown discusses the eating issues that arise for some lesbians. Perhaps more than many heterosexual women, lesbians are prepared to confront society's prescriptions for the way a woman's body is supposed to look. A feminist's and lover's body, sorry, as feminists and lovers of women's bodies, lesbians come to recognize that we are responsible for feeding ourselves appropriately. Thus, if alcoholism, sexual difficulties, and eating problems may exacerbate the stresses of being a lesbian, at the same time, being a lesbian may also provide a woman with special strengths for dealing with these issues. Intricacies of women's relationships with family members take on a special light for the lesbian. What we learned from our parents about misogyny, either subtly through our parents' heterosexual relationships or more vividly through incest, as Eileen Starzel, Starzapizil details, often remains to be sorted out in therapy. Although differentiation may be a problem for many women in relationships and perhaps for some men, we suspect it is a particular concern for many lesbians because it turns up so often in lesbian counseling and therapy, as Birch and Vargo point out. Merging or permeating ego boundaries is an exciting and powerful experience. It is an experience of closeness and being together and demands new levels of understanding the phenomena of relationships. But merging also has costs as one separates oneself, separates sense of self is upset. While independence and autonomy may, be, may represent male bias in psychological concepts, the subjective experiencing of an upset sense of separate self is distressing in a culture that prizes that prizes independence the struggle with homophobia has been mentioned at numerous points in this introduction as it is in numerous points in the book the overt and covert fear of lesbians in our society is conveyed to all of us at an early age in many ways moreover many of us are rewarded for staying in the closet as a result a lesbian must struggle with her desire to be authentic not only to herself, but also publicly and with her too often contradictory desire to get along comfortably in the world. The lesbian must deal by herself, in couples, and in community with the homophobia we have all internalized. As the chapter by Liz Margulies, Martha Becker, and Carla Jackson Brewer makes clear. For the mental health worker dealing with lesbian clients, it is important to recognize and understand the many issues of lesbian identity relationships and struggles we discuss in this book. In addition, the clinician, counselor, or therapist must, at a minimum, appreciate the ideology from which the lesbian is operating and respect and espouse it. And respect and espouse it. Factors such as race, class, and culture that cut across strictly quote-unquote lesbian and quote-unquote women's issues must be recognized for their place in the psychology in the psychological being of the lesbian. Struggles of the individual lesbian or the lesbian couple and the economic consequences of homophobia must be considered as well in therapy. Lesbian community. For the lesbian, 
community has a variety of meanings. Lesbian community in the 1950s meant everybody you ran into at your local lesbian bars. More recently, it included the spectrum of people you see at a lesbian at lesbian and women's concerts, the theater, conferences, and at parties. It also means friendship means friendship groups and support groups. Communal groups develop to, to deal with life circumstances from organizations such as the Daughters of Bilitis to lesbian to the lesbian mothers groups. In one major U.S. city, the lesbian considering motherhood group got so large with a mailing list of 500 that it divided into six support groups, one for lesbian considering adoption, one for lesbians currently being inseminated, and so forth. Community is also being expressed in terms of neighborhood lesbian groups in many cities. These meet both for social purposes and to take on political issues that express our power to the larger society. This lesbian community has all the advantages and potential problems of a small town, as Susan Krieger records in her book, The Mirror Dance. It offers social support for both the individual lesbian and for the couple. In the community, we can share such common experiences as coming out, and we can gain an understanding of the stages through which family members and co-workers will go in response to our coming out. In addition, individuals in the community can be counted on to provide many services in a non-hostile way, from counseling and legal assistance to crafts, childcare, bookstores, restaurants, bars, and printing presses. Because community provides us with support, assistance, and affirmation, we often have idealistic expectations of what it can offer, as Sarah Perlman and Francine Renan point out in their chapters. The community, in turn, has expectations of its members. Rules on quote-unquote political correctness result in conflict and decrease, decreasing loyalty to community. Perlman offers some theoretical explanations for this lack of respect for diversity. Raynon proposes that lesbian community develop as a spiritual level, at a spiritual level. Identification as a lesbian poses special problems for lesbians who also identify with other communities. Moreover, a certain single lesbian moreover, certain single lesbians have complained of a couple imperative within the community which means that couples will choose to associate with other couples and not to associate with single individuals. As Olivia Espin points out in her chapter, the choice to identify as a lesbian primarily or as a Latina primarily is a problematic one. Both communities pull the individual to behave in ways that are often contradictory. For different pairings of communities, moreover, and in different historical times, the conflicting, the conflicting weights we give to our several communities of reference may be different lesbian psychology. We have debated among ourselves as to how to study the lesbian psychology, sorry, how the study of lesbian psychology relates to the field of psychology generally and to the field of psychology of women more particularly. If lesbian psychology were a discipline, it would be like a discipline, it would, like all disciplines, include cognitive dimensions, normative dimensions, and an evaluative dimension. The cognitive dimensions would include a body of knowledge about the psychology of lesbians, as well as a body of knowledge about the techniques applied in research and in clinical work on the psychology of lesbians. It would also include an articulated sense of the necessary training for the individual lesbian psycho psychotherapist. The normative dimensions would elaborate a description of the range of psychological function of lesbians. They would also include a sense of the function of lesbian, of lesbian psychologists and a discussion of the ethics of the field. The evaluative dimension would include a professional association, a structure and system for publications, and a recognized unique identity with regard to the related fields such as psychology generally and the psychology of women. Lesbian psychology may eventually develop into such a field. There are indications that it already meets certain requirements for it. For example, there is a new professional organization within the American Psychological Association, Division 44, the Society for the Psychological Study of Lesbian and Gay Issues, a new journal, Lesbian Ethics, that goes beyond but includes psychological issues, and a relatively recent literature on feminist clinical psychology that sometimes deals with lesbian concerns, including special issues of journals. But many of the other aspects which would define lesbian psychology as a full-fledged discipline or profession do not exist, and may never come to exist. Indeed, we are not sure that they are desirable. Perhaps ours should remain an interdisciplinary field in order to take advantage of all that has developed 
of value in the feminist study of the psych of the psychology of women. The psychology of women has articulated the many ways in which models and assumptions within psychology generally are inadequate for accurate understanding of women. We maintain that this is all the more true for lesbians, and we touch on this in the final section of this introduction. The psychology of women offers us many aspects of a discipline and a profession. Research methods, modes of scholarship, ethics, training, techniques, and skills, professional associations, journals, and a recognized unique identity. It also offers us a corpus of knowledge about women's experience pertinent to most women and thus to many lesbians, but the special issues of lesbians have been slighted. Historically, feminist psychologists and political organizations have not and could not focus on lesbian issues if they were to be taken seriously by the larger, not yet feminist society. If we examine causes, however, we realize that it is because of the mere existence of lesbians, women who succeed in living relatively apart from men, is too threatening to the patriarchy and to heterosexual women. For precisely this reason, we would propose that lesbian psychology be seen as the core of psychology of women, toward which this discipline has been moving. The study of lesbian psych psychology, we are convinced, poses the fundamental challenge to psychology. It permits us to view women in her quote-unquote quote purest form, that is, as untainted by the patriarchy as possible. It permits us to view her not only in her various personal aspects, but also in relation to other women and communities of women, and to build entirely new models of how women relate in the world. Many of the issues discussed in the chapter of in the chapters of this book are issues on which solid work has been done in feminist psychology. Issues of relationships, sexuality, identity, conflict resolution, women's relations to parents and children. For each of these issues, Contributions to our book discuss the particular implications for lesbians. Vargo, for example, discusses the principles of feminist counseling or how the principles of feminist counseling may be extended for use with the lesbian individual and the lesbian couple. Other issues would seem unique to lesbians. One theme that is key, that is a key issue throughout the book, is the response to homophobia in our society. Studies remain to be done on the ways in which response to homophobia may be similar to or different from the other prejudices in our society based on race, color, ethnicity, religion, and class. Evaluation of how much we can learn about homophobia from societal misogyny and its repercussions for women generally needs study. Within the field of psychology of women, there is if not a debate, a divergence of opinions. For example, are Freud's psychodynamic theories and the object relation the relations theories useful ways to think about the psychology of women or dangerous ones? Rather than attempt to come to a collective decision on the relative merits and difficulties with these theories, we have chosen to incorporate the several essays on which these issues as an example of diversity. In the diversity of approach, even within the feminist psycho psychology community, as it considers lesbians. In principle, we do not resolve the somewhat different explanations for the decrease in sexuality in lesbian relationships offered by chapters by the chapters by Vargo and Nichols. Of course, a part of each of us would like to know what the quote unquote right answer is. If we had it, we could get to work on it, correcting any problems, assuming we agreed that decreased sex in relationships is a problem. But in this spirit of open opening up and discussion, Sorry, but in this spirit of opening up discussion and with the feminist sense that there will always be a certain context dependency making inappropriate our expectations that there will be a single true answer, we have chosen to include chapters representing somewhat different views. Readers will no doubt find numerous other such examples in the course of the chapters that follow, and perhaps they will discover entire topics that should be included in the matrix for studying lesbian psychology that are not represented in here. In any event, we are sure that the topics that we have included are necessary for a study of lesbian psychology. Discussion of the individual lesbian as she relates to herself, to other lesbians in couple relationships, to her family of origin and her family of choice, to various communities in society, and to her therapist or clients, must surely form core points of study in the psychology of lesbians, whether the enterprise is regarded as a separate discipline or as the touchstone for the psychology of women. New Directions 
This work represents a beginning effort to capture the experience of contemporary American lesbian. The chapters in this volume draw on a limited body of existing research, theory, and clinical data from the psychology of women and traditional psychology. In presenting these essays that articulate and share experiences, raise questions, challenge traditional assumptions, and offer new perspectives, our goal has been to start a continuing discussion out of which will develop a dynamic, growing lesbian psychology. In this book, lesbians come out to psychology. And just as an individual's coming out is a process in which there is a commitment and a clarity and the need for maturation, so in the coming out of a group, there is the need for growth. In this final section of our introduction, we want to suggest that some directions for development. Feminism has an important lesson for lesbians. The necessity of questioning traditional assumptions. Cultural models of male-female differences are deeply embedded in clinical thought and clinical processes. Awareness of these assumptions will lead to a valuing and prizing of the diversities of women's experiences. For example, feminist enlightenment might lead to a, re to a relaxation of the non-pluralist non assumptions that there are standards for frequency and amount of sex in successful long-term lesbian relationships, and there are appropriate and inappropriate amounts of food that women should feed themselves. See Brown's discussion of eating problems in this volume. Similarly, awareness of male power, motives, and social manipulations can serve as a liberating agent, enabling lesbians to see how we and our mothers have been victimized and led to devalue ourselves and each other. Gender biases and psychological models have started to be explored by feminists. What had previously been seen as truth has been shown to derive from models contaminated by masculine ideas of objectivity and control. Awareness of this gender bias will lead us to ask further how our views of our own experience and how lesbian research and theory are colored by traditional views and assumptions. It will make it possible for us to expand our inquiry into the ways that external forces have shaped our internal psychologies, how patriarchy, homophobia, heterosexism, and social manipulations and in policy, function, and belief have influenced lesbian experience. Detailed analyses of these external forces have not been a major concern in this book. The focus has been primarily on intra-psychic processes and intrapersonal dynamics. Such analyses are important. As we have said, it does not make sense to ignore the, important, the importance of the mother and father in understanding individual development. Revisions of object relation theory as it may apply in the lesbian experience, offer therapists a useful orientation and are in keeping with clinical traditions in psychology. However, the impact of the external world is equally important. It shapes and influences us and becomes internal. Within lesbian psychology, therefore, and in psychology in general, the impact of the external requires substantial further analysis of how the political becomes personal. As the impact of social and political forces, such as homophobia and patriarchy, become central to our understandings, we can begin to introduce and revise other non-psychodynamic theories, and we can invent new models. Drawing on social learning theory and developing pluralistic, women-valuing psychological models, for example, would add not only a fresh perspective, but also one that does not lead to the labeling, to labeling behavior as pathological. Variations in the coming out process and in the ways we form couples might then be interpreted as creative women-centered modes of living and not as quote-unquote problems to be dealt with in psychotherapy. For example, fusion might not be seen as pathological but rather as a healthy development of boundaries that serve to protect the couple from a homophobic culture. The social and political forces that make it necessary for a couple to fuse in order to protect themselves from a homophobic culture may also limit our vision so that the creative potential of fusion is not seen. The merged state in which fusion occurs may, in fact, be an example of an optimum state of human interaction, one that transcends isolating ego boundaries. Such a viewpoint is, long away, is a long way from our standard psychodynamic conceptualization. Implicit in the psychodynamic models that underlie such current thinking is the notion that discomfort means something is amiss, something that must be overcome by the lesbian individual, couple, or community. In contrast, views that take account of both the external forces impinging on lesbians and the impact of those forces on internal responses might interpret discomfort as a critical indication of awareness and coping. Thus, 
discomfort would become an indicator of creative adjustment rather than pathology. As lesbian psychology matures, it will integrate the political analyses and theoretical challenge of feminism, producing a lesbian-affirming clinical orientation. The merging of feminist perspectives, pol politics, and values with clinical thinking is perhaps the greatest need in carrying forward the discussion that is open and invited by this book.